You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options House, a powerful, easy-to-use, and intuitive online trading platform that's not only fast and reliable, but comes with dedicated customer service and a great trading experience. Trade on the platform that's top rated by Barron's and Stockbrokers.com. With completely transparent, value-oriented pricing, Options House is your all-in-one solution for options, futures, and stock trading. Plus, open and fund a new account at OptionsHouse.com slash insider today and trade commission-free for 60 days. Options House is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rockin' tune means it's time once again for a little program we like to call around here, the Option Block, a little bit of bi-weekly fun in the world of options. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, ever-scintillating Options Insider Radio Network. Fifteen programs for you guys to choose from on the old network, including many, many 550-plus archived episodes of this fine program, The Option Block. Where can you find all that options goodness? Well, the easiest place is, of course, our website, theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the Insider Radio Network tab, and, of course, your audio journey has begun. Of course, we have a lot of great written content while you're there as well, so you can go there and mainline the audio. We won't hold it again. We also have great alerts from the options market, unusual activity, breaking news, education, all that fun stuff. So if I'm over there, you got some time in your work day, and you want to want to read about them, their options, well, we got some... Got some good reading for you to do up there. And, of course, you can always find the radio as well via all the usual suspects, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher. Recently added a few new ones in the last couple of months. Added Google Play Podcast. They just came online a couple of months ago. And just in the last week, we added iHeartRadio as well. So as more and more outlets get hip to this whole podcast thing, we will continue uh, to add them as well. And, of course, you can always grab us via our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the ever-scintillating, ever, ever fun I'm sure three of you out there at least have it, Fire OS. All right, and joining me on the old program today, let's go in order of proximity again. So I got to start with the guy just breathing over my shoulder here on the left, <laughs> Mr. Todd Rich. He is the president of Option Monster Media. Todd, welcome back to the Option Block program on this special Thursday edition of the show. Of course, we had the holiday on Monday, no show then, so we're back here on Thursday. Welcome back to the program, Todd. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. A little weird to come on a Thursday. A little weird. does feel a little crazy, but I like it. Mixing it up. It's kind of good. It's kind of go back into our, going back to our old mail block Thursday day as well, so it kind of fits uh, in that sense as well. And also joining me a little bit farther away in this little remote hamlet known as St. Charles, Illinois, where we are joined by none other than Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the Option Block program on this fine Thursday to you as well. Oh, always happy to be here, and I think I want to get a Fire OS just so I can be one of the elite few. Yeah, you and like three other folks out there really loving the Amazon. I'm sure there are more. I haven't checked the stats in a while, but does, <laughs> it does certainly pales in comparison to the iOS and indeed uh, to the Android. Uh, so yeah, but it is fun to see that rocking. Get the old Kindle Fire. They're only like 50 bucks, Uncle Mike. You can swing it. And then uh, you too can join the Fire OS crew out there loving the option block. And last but not least, 
we go farther away to a land shrouded in mystery, a land few of you have probably heard of, a place called Maine, where we are joined by none other than the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, by way of a little place called Option Pit. Dot com. Mr. G, welcome back to the Option Block program, sir. How was your long Labor Day weekend? It was quite nice, actually. It was quite nice. I, Even though I was ready to take umbrage early, I, I recovered because my trip was so nice. You're always, uh, you're full of umbrage all the time, sir. So we'll just, uh, we'll let you stew in your umbrage as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block. Like the man said, this is the portion of the program where we break down what was moving, what was shaking, what was rocking, what was rolling in today's market activity. We are recording this, I forgot to mention at the top of the show, also streaming it live on Thursday, September 8th via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. So if you're around, you can join us every Monday except for this Monday, of course, and Thursday at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. We'd love to see you there in that little chat room. You can just follow us on social media. We tweet the, tweet the link out there, or we can find us on the website, or just sign up for Mixler. It's free, and you can get notifi notified whenever our new programs go live. The instant we're streaming, you can be in there, and, of course, a little chat room around the show as well. So if you have questions, comments, uh, fun witticisms to share with us here on the old program, uh, you guys can do that as well. And not the most uh, scintillating of days here, on the old street today, we are kicking off this what is traditionally one of the one of the first real weeks back after, shall we say, a bit of a light uh, summer doldrums period. In fact, we talked earlier about the numbers from OCC uh, being very weak for August, down nearly, I believe, thirty percent, depending on which product category you're looking. It was also August was the lowest ADV for puts and calls since October of 2012. So August, pretty much, however you cut it, any way you slice it, August was. A fairly light month. A lot of people hoping maybe SEP, uh, particularly after the Labor Day weekend here in the States, tends to pick up a little bit. Volume picks up. Maybe Vol will pick up a little bit as well as we're recording this today and streaming it live. Most of the major indices finishing off slightly on the day. S&P off about a quarter of a percentage point dial. Similarly, off uh, tech-heavy NASDAQ off a little bit more, off over half a percent today. Uh, we'll get to some of that in a little bit. And, of course, uh, VIX Cash coming back after uh, some other interesting days and a little bit of a sell-off today. Getting back a little bit, getting north of the 12 handle again, closing right around 12 and a quarter or so. So a lot of interesting things to uh, talk about. Maybe we'll, let's, do, let's go in order of proximity again. Uh, Mr. Todd, you and I were chatting before the show started uh, about all the different stuff. You guys are obviously over there at Option Monster. You're always running interesting scans on different market sectors and different segments. And uh, you were sharing a few of those nuggets with me before the show. So let's get into those as well as whatever else may have caught your eye in today's market activity, sir. Oh, for sure. Um, this is actually what Option Monster does. We've got some in incredible tools that if you go out there, you can take a look. And our, we have a, a thing called Research Lab. And you can take a look and find some of those places in the market where there is some activity. And one thing we've noticed lately, uh, you know, as, as everyone's looking for an opportunity, was it snuck up on us is Latin American utilities. Uh, people kind of checked out on Latin America, and uh, you saw this sell-off over the past several years. And in the last few months, it has come back. They're hitting all-time highs for the, their year. And across the board, I mean, just something I'm not quite sure what that means, why people are looking back at Latin American again. Maybe they're going to see some, they're hoping to see some things in Brazil. Or, But uh, the nice thing about those that, that particular group, and you can go and take a look at it at Option Monster, you hit groups and we, we kind of dice up the market into our, our own little subsectors. But a yeah, lot of those... Yeah, it's LATAM utility if you're looking for it. L-A-T-A-M there on the Option Monster site, listeners. Um, that'll bring you all the different uh, components that are in there and a lot of other interesting nuggets. I'm looking at it as well as you're talking, Todd, so, so I have added there. Yeah, no, it's just it, over the last week, two weeks, month, three months, I've uh, just been seeing a, a fairly significant rally, and they're utility stocks. And they also pay a, a pretty decent dividend, so not only you know people who've kind of jumped into those – uh, seen some capital appreciation. They've been collecting their dividends as well. And they're just a, a bunch of names that you generally wouldn't particularly go look for. Uh, but it does help uh, when you're looking in these slow markets and you're not quite sure where to go. 
Uh, Option Monster does help you find some of those hotspots. Scanning all the time so you don't have to, right? <laughs> right, Todd? There you uh, I'm looking. Here you go. My marketing invoice will be in the mail forthwith. We can come up with a, a nice tagline as necessary here, but I'm looking here at the LATAM utility members. It's like there's about six different names in here, listeners. Uh, and the interesting about it, because not all of them are, of course, your household names unless you're deeply uh, entrenched in the world of Latin American utilities, which I know I am not. So it might be interesting kind of nuggets. People are always writing us all the time. Where can I look a little bit farther afield for some action, some volatility, something interesting in this relatively quiet period in the market we kind of just came out of? Maybe, who knows, maybe Latin American utilities. I guarantee you it's a sector you probably didn't think of. So that in and of itself is worthy, I think, of, uh, of some notes there as we keep rolling on. Mr. Rock Lobster, let's turn to you now. Uh, we talked about VIX Ketten, a little bit of a, an uptick here. VIX Cash back over uh, the 12 handle. We'll see if it can sell off again to make my volatility views prediction correct uh, for tomorrow's show. I got another day or so ahead of me before that has to. I have to get my whirlwind, reap the whirlwind on that. But uh, that said, uh, what caught your eye in today's activity and what was lighting up the old pit chat today? Um, a couple things lighting up the pit chat. Um, TLT moving lower. A little surprise after Draghi. Basically, I think he's kind of announced the end of European QE. That's sort of how it, it looked. Banks rallied, um, and you know, banks rallied pretty hard. Bond prices are down everywhere. So it looks as if there's going to be... Um, it basically, he didn't put out there, like, we're going to add more. He sort of just said, well, March 2017, it would probably be the end of our bond buying. But we could keep going. We could do something else, but that's probably going to be the end. Uh, and then banks rallied, bonds, and then, and then all the major, uh, you know, all the major bonds all dropped in price. Yields all went up a little bit. So I think the market kind of looked at that. So I was surprised, not surprised that VIX went up. Um, because it's already trading around 12, right? But the market actually, it actually was in the 11 handle on the close uh, yesterday, but the market sort of took this little rally in, or, or the little rally in yields and um, ignored it. So I think you could see your VIX... Um, I think you could see VIX easily getting into the 11 handle tomorrow. It's catching a bid today into the weekend. So uh, you you could start to look good there. Uh, what also I thought there was a lot of, and we'll talk about in the odd block, but a lot of call buying, put selling and stuff around XOP, XLE, all the little junky uh, exploration and production, uh, the drillers, uh, the offshore drillers like rig, just – there's a lot of paper in there with oil going, looks starting to stare at 50 again. You know, again, there is, oh, there's the narrative has been like sort of things are bad and oil prices are going to go down, all this kind of stuff that it was sort of baked into a lot of these names. A lot of them are still like all the, a lot of big part of XOP, a lot of the offshore drillers, a lot of domestic drillers still trading at really low, um, really low levels relative. So there was some call buying and there was a little action in there. So that led up to pit chat. Um, we looked at CMG as well as little bounce. I guess Ackman's trying to buy or did buy a stake in it. I, I mean, I don't know. I, he's been wrong on a couple, so maybe he's due for a hot streak again. Um, and at the same time, VIX futures themselves, you know, just did not move a whole lot. The market didn't really drop a lot, dropped a little bit. Um, but you didn't see really any action out of uh, the VIX futures at all. So it, it seems like uh, stocks and buyers of stocks took the, uh, the ECB announcement in stride and kind of kept on moving. So I think more there's more of a reason that I think, you know, Apple was down $3 today or almost $3. So that was probably most of the drop everywhere. If Apple was hunched on the day, I think we'd probably be up. So anyway, um, uh, we'll see how how all that shakes out going into tomorrow and the rest of the week. But, you know, it, we had the most significant break in bonds that I can remember. And we're now we're starting to stare at kind of those uh, we're at. Let's I believe we're at the low tick for TLT. 
since we are, we, I think we did today, since that whole Brexit thing happened, we got, we almost made a low tick for the last uh, two, two and a half months. So we're right there on the bubble of whether it can go, if it keep going. But it, I'll just say it's, it's not, it did not look great for bonds and the market actually took it okay. So we'll, we'll see if that goes along and you can win your weekly Volviews bet and get a beer out of um, Russell or Mark. Yeah, good luck getting any beers out of Mark. That, that would be a victory, a moral victory <laughs> in and of itself. By the way, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rockhaus, so he's not very bored. He's just, I think, still on vacation. That's why we hear all those crickets. Are you still on vacation in the Cape there, sir? Uh, no, actually, those are the crickets uh, around just, my just the main uh, rural crickets. home. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually, it sounds like there's a cricket. I, it sounds like Jiminy Cricket is on your shoulder as you're talking. I, I'll close my windows, but I am surrounded by... Um, <laughs> this thing called nature? It's, there's a lot of nature. What is what? I don't know what you're talking about, sir. That's uh, that's madness. Is that means that is nature. The fire trucks, then police cars that go by our studio windows here, 24/7. Uh, that's what we call nature here <laughs> down here. Uh, going back to before, what you're talking about with uh, the market's reactions and perhaps not being uh, overly enthused in certain areas. You can certainly sum up the market's reaction to uh, the new iPhone <laughs> with a bit of a collective shrug. Uh, Apple off today, nearly 3%, about 2.6%, nearly three handles today, closing right around 105 and a half or so. Uh, Uncle Mike, I know this is your neck of the woods. You're not as big into the Apple holdings as you once were, uh, but still you are a, a devotee of all things Apple. This is usually a period where we saw a decent run-up uh, going into an announcement like that. And sometimes, some months we've seen, you know, 3 to 4% in the lead up to a new iPhone announcement. I uh, didn't really see that. It was a bit of an anemic rise out there in Apple stock. Then, of course, uh, selling off afterwards. So if you were out there banking on this uh, inevitable Apple rally coming into the announcement, then uh, not so much today. But that said, what are your thoughts on the announcement and what's been going on in the stock? Any readjusting out there in Apple for you, as well as what else is catching your eye out there today? couple things. Let's talk about Apple to start with. Uh, I had a friend on Facebook saying uh, Apple will not be having the headphone jack in the new iPhone. Thus, I am moving to Android. I, you know, I don't think that's a good move with what they're doing. Uh, I know eventually we'll probably all have wires will be a thing of the past, but I don't think it's quite time to get rid of the headphone jack as of yet. Uh, if you just look in the Metro train or just if you look around Chicago, even people still use corded headphones. They're still a pretty big part of things. Uh, so I don't know if that's the best thing to do as of yet. Uh, the other thing with which they're doing in this new phone is it seems like it reminds me of the XFL in a way. If you guys remember that league that was trying to say, oh, we're not trying to compete with the NFL. And so a lot of people are interested in it two weeks and we're better than the NFL. That's kind of what it feels to me like Apple's doing. And the reference I'm making is to that of the camera on the iPhone. They're trying to say that uh, this camera on the Apple is just that good. And uh, they actually, I believe it's tomorrow, they're going to be posting some Sports Illustrated pictures with a Sports Illustrated photographer using the new Apple iPhone and just to kind of showcase the, the power of that camera. Now, there's no doubt in my mind, it's probably going to be a phenomenal camera by a phone standard, but someone who's normally looking to have that high quality of a picture typically would buy a, cam a specialty camera, a specialty, I believe it's a DSLR camera. And so I don't know if that's really going to attract a photography aficionado to buying the phone just because it has that. So I really don't like the things that Apple's doing with us. I think that it's a, some interesting ideas, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Now, with that being said, there's a lot of people out there in the cycle of renewing their phones that are going to need a new phone pretty soon. And uh, when that happens, there's just the Apple junkies out there that will go with an Apple and the people that uh, have drinking the Kool-Aid and think that it's Apple and only Apple is the only thing that exists in the universe. And I remember just I have a, an uncle who's uh, about 60 years old. And so he has an iPhone. He had something happen to it where it was giving him this weird message. So I helped him fix it. And I was saying, oh, have you ever thought about getting an Android? I don't think it does this. And he just looked at me just scared to death. He's like, I wouldn't want anything that complicated. And so that's just kind of the, the Kool-Aid with which Apple sells is that we're the simplest, we're the best, we are Apple. And so there's people like my uncle 
there's people that uh, are just lo love Apple. Uh, so with that, once it's out, I do think there's going to be a lot of people that'll buy the new iPhone just for those reasons with which I just mentioned. So I think the news of what Apple's doing with it, it's bad initially, but it might lead to a little bit of a pop uh, after it goes down a little bit more is kind of my opinion on that. Uh, other things that are going on in the marketplace, uh, I was just looking at a chart uh, earlier t today, uh, SPY, exactly one month ago today, uh, on uh, today is September 8th, for those of you that are not listening live, on August 8th, the close for the day was 218.05. The close for the day today was 218.51. So we've moved roughly four points in the S&P 500 over the course of the last month. Not been a lot of action, folks, and I got to say that I was kind of expecting a little bit more to come in this week, but really nothing's happened as of yet. So, uh, you know, maybe maybe people are uh, spending another week in the south of France or something like that, or maybe they went to start to short bonds or maybe buy some oil because there's action at other places or in the Brazilian utilities, as I hear. So uh, just another interesting note is how we have kind of a slow market this week. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we get some movement next week. And uh, in terms of Sebastian buying beer, I'm going to stand up for the guy because he bought me a phenomenal steak one time, and he's offered to do it on other <laughs> occasions. So I'm standing up for Sebastian. That I one steak that once in beer. 2012 was quite delicious. I agree with you. Um, that was a phenomenal steak dinner, you have to admit. Start talking Apple. The people come out, Uncle Mike. Miss Fitchius here in our chat asking, hey, Uncle Mike, just wondering why you think the headphone jack removal matters when every iPhone 7 will ship with a uh, lightning to audio adapter. So there you go. The Apple devotees. Pushing back, sir. What ha what do you say here for Miss Phidias? I'm assuming that's a woman. Well, I think that with that happening, uh, you're, you're trying to create some type of big change to it. What if you, lo what if you lose those headphones? Wh and with that, uh, as a user of wired headphones myself on my Android, uh, by doing that, I believe it is easier to keep track of them. And so if you do lose those the, um, the the special headphones for the iP the uh, iPhone, uh, what, I believe it's what ninety nine dollars to buy new ones. Whereas if I lose my uh, headphones for my Android, I can just go to the dollar store, my, my favorite store of all time, Dollar General, and I think I can get it for what a dollar, I believe. So I think that's going to be a problem for people. And I'm not a fan. I just I don't think we're ready for it as of yet. Well, I've actually. I'm going to take the other side of that. I'll play the devil's advocate. Um, you, what you'll end up seeing is you'll end up seeing a bunch of uh, third parties license that lightning jack technology and producing lower cost, uh, maybe even higher quality sounding phones, using just like they've done with the, the regular headphone jack. And the interesting thing there is Apple will get a, a royalty on, you know, because they own that that mini jack they've got that patent on that MiFi or whatever it's MiFid connection so it there could be uh, another revenue stream they're just kind of embedded into the fact that people do like the, they sell a lot of apple uh, of, of iphones it is a pretty solid product um it's just not the company isn't priced as that growth company anymore and uh, they've really just priced them it's a low pe uh it's all been put into the stock uh, people do like them, the, the iPhone, and people buy them all over the globe. Apple's never met a proprietary port that, or technology, indeed, that they don't, uh, they don't like and smile upon broadly. Uh, Uncle Mike, I guess you have, uh, you have won her over, Miss Fitchia, saying good point to you. So apparently uh, you have brought her to the dark side with you. Maybe that isn't, uh, isn't the worst thing uh, after all. The other thing, speaking of the dark side really quickly, before we move on to the odd block, it was, of course, a, uh, a big day out there in crude as well. Kind of mixed signals. Uh, coming in on crude land. All you have to do is search for crude in any of the big uh, outlets, Bloomberg and the Journal, for example, and you'll get two diametrically opposed stories, which is kind of funny. Uh, the Journal, others talking about, of course, kind of the bit of the surprise of uh, surprise drop in stocks, which as a result, of course, uh, sent uh, WTI up about 3 to 4% today and the other products as well. Of course, a lot of people who have a little bit longer view on crude saying that was just hurricane related and that's going to come back down a little bit, but still uh, crude rallying hard today and others as a result of that. Then, of course, you flip on over some other outlets like Bloomberg and others who are over at this uh, big Asia-Pacific Petroleum Conference 
and all the uh, all the big professional crude traders over there in that conference are all still significantly bearish uh, on crude, expecting it to remain pretty much where it is now or a little bit to the south easily in this, what they're saying, 40 to $60 a barrel. Rant. Again, that's a pretty wide range. I think a lot of people could hit that bullseye if they, if they threw that one there. Uh, but still, and they're saying that even with uh, the stocks coming up, we still haven't seen uh, the rebalancing a lot of people were expecting uh, given all just where we are. And also, uh, shale and others have remained uh, surprisingly robust. Russian oil still cranking out a lot of barrels per day, as well as Saudi Arabia and others. So we haven't seen the hurricanes notwithstanding. We haven't seen yet the, uh, the supply drawdown that a lot of uh, people have been expecting. I don't know, Todd, have you been looking at a lot? I know you do a lot of scans over there. Have you looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of crude-related topics over the world there, there as well in the land of Option Monster? Oh, for sure everyone is paying close attention. And uh, you mentioned, and I just think it's kind of interesting, is you mentioned Russia and Saudi Arabia, and they've been meeting and they've been trying to come to an arrangement or some type of an accord, uh, and it's, you'll hear it as Russia and OPEC, but it's really Russia and Saudi Arabia, both saying, hey, we're going to come together and we're going to uh, try to stabilize the market by stabilizing production, but you've got two countries that are notorious uh, for not being particularly trustworthy. And I think that the credibility of, you know, when they talk like they're going to back off of oil production and you see a spike in, in oil prices, you might see an immediate, you know, reaction to that afterwards is these guys aren't going to do that. They still need the money. Uh, and, and so they're not going to cut back on production because they just need to keep cranking out more oil. They need the cash. Uh, so... Yeah, they're between a rock and a hard place there. They could, of course, uh, that's the problem they've been facing for a year or two now where they can slow down the spigot let the price go back up, but they need they need to print money at the end of the day, so they keep hitting it. And what happens when you hit the bid all day long? <laughs> things tend to drop uh, over time, and I think with that, we're going to keep on rolling, talking crew to some other stuff cooking in there in today's activity as well. Uh, so let's keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. That funky tune means it's time once again. For the odd block, the portion of the program here where we put on our fedoras and our trench coats and we bravely adventure into the parts of the options market that maybe you, you polite, well-heeled, well-intentioned folk just don't want to go. You're too smart, <laughs> but we do it for you anyway. We're going to kick things off in an area that probably makes a lot of sense given exactly what we were just talking about. Going to kick things off with RIG. This is Transocean a limited ticker symbol RIG uh, closing today right about 10 half up about a half a buck or about five a little over five uh, percent today if you're not familiar with these guys uh, they provide contract drilling services for offshore oil and gas wells so given the fact all this movement in crude these guys are rocking and rolling uh, today as well his name's been averaging about 25,000 contracts a day Today, doing nearly 33,000, over, over 33,000 today, about nearly four to one calls over puts. That should give you some idea of what caught our eye. And the only way you can really uh, sum these up, Mr. Rock Lobster, I think, is just, uh, just swinging for the fences calls here in good old rig. Someone looking at the news today saying, you know what, that's it. Crude's back. Crude is back hard. And apparently crude is back like tomorrow because these guys are not messing around. They're not buying Ock or Dees or Jan calls. No, they're buying the SEP weeklies. So expiring very soon, expiring with literally one day to go. Uh, the SEP 10 half calls for a nickel. We first saw 700 of these going up. Uh, paper gobbling up for a nickel as the day went on. A total of nearly 10,000. 9,500 going up on sweeps across multiple exchanges, including uh, the SIBO. Uh, they started getting bid up. Nickel, they got filled, then $0.07 cent bid. They went out $0.09 cents at $0.11. Cents. Of course, some of that, of course, due to the rally as well in the stock. So huge, huge interest here in these effectively daily uh, 10 half calls at this point. 
Uh, this is a bit of a, a bit of an interesting one. Looking back at where rig has been just in the last few months, this thing has been well north of these levels, even just as recently as mid-July was trading around the 13 handle. So this thing could easily be back north of that. Whether it happens tomorrow <laughs> is another another question. I don't know. Mr. Rock Lobster, let's start there. Um, a lot of interesting thing to parse. I think nothing more interesting, of course, than just the the, shall we say, short frenzied duration of these calls. Uh, what do you have to say for our friend here who's loading up in rig? Yeah, what do you think about the duration of that call? That's a funky one. You know, people are always <laughs> writing to us saying, when are we going to have dailies? When are we going to have dailies? These are effectively dailies. A weekly of one day to go is literally a daily. And uh, clearly there is some interest in these. I, I don't... I don't see I don't see what our friend here is seeing, but uh, you know these are close to at the money now. The stock was rallying pretty hard. In fact, let's see intraday it did get as high, actually it closed only about ten high about as high as ten fifty one. So it never there was never a point where these calls were seriously in the money. So I thought maybe he saw something intraday that maybe sparked him to dive in, but that wasn't the case. Uh, either way, interesting stuff. These are pretty much all decay all the time. So. He's got to hit his home run. He's got to hit it early tomorrow for these bad boys uh, to make it to make it off. So I don't know what what do you counsel to someone who comes into the pit chat wanting to do this kind of thing? Besides, no. You know what? I, I this is one of my closet favorite stocks uh, from a risk like you know, risky equity, but you, you're, it's almost like they're not going to drill anymore or there's not going to be any offshore. I mean, the company has a backlog and it's been a favorite of the shorts because, because nobody's going to drill offshore anymore. It's too expensive, right? If oil's too expensive, if oil's not, uh, if oil prices don't kind of get back up there. So, but it's one of the, you know, few stocks in the oil patch that are still really, it's fairly close to its lows. I mean, the dead low, I think was like eight bucks. Uh, it was there for a little while. Um, but, so what I do is counsel us, instead of buying these, I just actually sold some 10 puts today. I decided, you know what, whatever, I'll take delivery of this one. I don't mind too much. Um, so I just sold some 10 puts a little farther out. And if I get a little rally, I'm going to buy some uh, slightly out of money calls and just leave myself with a risk reversal for credit if the rally kind of continues. But the stock was just nine and a half bucks. It's rallied with oil. So I figured it pulls back to where it came from. So normally what I counsel is, okay, there's hot money. They're buying a bunch of calls. They think it's going to explode. Um, could be right. But what I try to think of is, okay, so if the stock goes right back to where all of the excitement was before, it was about nine and a half, what are you going to be left with? So I figure if I can just, you know, at least around break even down where it all started from, then there might be something there. But it's it's a stock that I don't mind owning anyway. And um so anyway, that's what I did. So hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to sell some calls, or if if it actually really rallies, then I'll just keep you know the the put credits, which is fine. So, but it, it I thought it was a pretty you know, it, and the thing is, is those things were so cheap for so long, um, you know, and they'll probably tomorrow, you know, where where are those calls going to go? I mean, they could open a quarter, they could open anywhere. It doesn't. It takes very little for them to go anywhere. I mean, if you paid a nickel and they're trading a quarter, that's not bad. So um, I, I find the volatility in this name um, not very expensive relative to um, you know, the potential it, the thing has. So I think uh, it's, this is one of the few times where the nickel buy I don't think was, you know, it wasn't a terrible buy. It was they had a decent shot uh, on the back of oil prices rising and. But it still feels like they knew they were, they were privy to some other stuff. That's all I'll say. Felt that's what this one felt like because we saw most. We've seen most of these. Mark go what? We've seen them sort of just fizzle away to yeah. They wither and die very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing. It's uh, yeah. It's not exactly. These are, these are home run, but these are also this guy's going to be glued to his screens this morning because uh, every tick of the clock going by is going to make these uh, these calls get further and further away from anything approaching. Uh, popularity here, or profitability, I should say. Uh, so as we move on to our next name, surprise, surprise, we're still in the energy realm this time, moving on over to a cu couple of frequent offenders here on the odd block today. First, Rig, haven't had them on in a little while. We've talked about them quite a bit. And also now Chesapeake, CHK, 
Uh, another frequent offender here on the odd block. Also, some of our resident cheapies. This one closing today, $7.74, up about nearly a buck or nearly 14%. Uh, so obviously, rally ho day out here in uh, Chesapeake. This is a name that does about 46,000 contracts a day. Lighten it up to the tune of 184,000 today, about two to one calls over puts. And the calls are pretty much uh, where our attention was drawn. This this was a weird one, Mr. Rob. We, we, we talk about some weird ones. This one is certainly weird. I don't know, Todd, maybe this one came up on your, on your screens as well today. It's kind of interesting. We saw someone just lighting up. I think we refer to it on the website as a cage match on the seven strike here uh, in, uh, in CHK as someone was just lighting up these weekly Again, expiring tomorrow, uh, SEP 7 calls, uh, blasting them away. At the time, the stock was about nearly a buck lower, so these were going up for $0.13, and paper was blasting them out, 1,267 of them to start. As the day went on, more than 10x piling in, about 13,000 and change, lighting it up on this strike. And what was interesting about these, Mr. Rock Lobster, a couple of things, but I think probably most interesting was the fact that they were doing it for effectively parity, a couple of cents over uh, which uh, this is that's one of those trades when you see that going up you kind of just like what are you what are you up to what are you about here I mean there's there's 13,000 and change going up only 3,000 opening you could certainly maybe see an argument for doing it if it was closing you're coming in you're gonna blast them out you don't care where you get it maybe you had a profit you're you're sitting on you don't care if you give it up a little bit there but when you're coming in and you're aggressively uh, aggressively opening at or around parity uh, it, it's kind of hard to uh, to champion that. Obviously, people were stepping in to buy these and doing it pretty hard, hence our cage match uh, conversation from earlier. Also saw some decent paper on the SEP 7 halves. So weekly is going out uh, tomorrow, as well as the the 8s with doing about 5,000 and 3,000 contracts, respectively. So all those strikes lightened it up. I don't have the prints on the latter kind, so I'm, hopefully they were a little bit better <laughs> than the 7s, but I don't know. Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, what are your thoughts here on just unleashing size with one day to go at effectively parity. Isn't that the oddest thing? Like all, all these calls traded 13 cents <laughs> and 13, 15, like they just kept selling them and selling them. I don't know what the deal was, uh, but they were finding willing buyers. I mean, you're buying that, that seven straddle. You could buy the seven straddle for what? Three cents over parity or something like that. It was crazy. So, I just wish that I would have seen it faster, <laughs> but I didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> I'll take um, some of those, please. I'll take some of those. You can those do something with parody calls, I would think, just maybe. I could. I could do something with those. Um, but, again, the very odd paper took me a while to kind of figure it out. I'm like, really? Somebody so, But it looked like, like there was a bid. Bid got hit, 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 hit. Then offer stayed up. And then, obviously, as, as the liquidity providers are getting some stock filled, uh, they scooped it up. CHK uh, was of high short interest when it was down below $2, and it's made a pretty big comeback. I believe it's an icon holding. Uh, I think he owns that in FCX from higher prices. But very interesting. Uh, it's feeling like a little squeezy. And I'm still confused on the call seller. It almost feels like it felt like somebody programmed an algo backwards <laughs> to, just to keep dumping calls out there because there was just <laughs> oh wait there's a lot of <laughs> I didn't mean to sell those. I whoa wait a minute I I hit the I hit the green button I hit the red button when I want to hit the green button so very very odd paper but the buyers it looked like are extremely happy today at, you know. What are you going to do? The, the stock closed 770. I mean, how, how unhappy can you be when that yeah, happens? Yeah, the buyers, that worked out. The guy who dumped them for 13 cents, uh, I'm guessing not so, not so happy. That's the kind of trade that would get you, I think, that tap on the shoulder down on the floor of the SIBO. They'd be like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you got <laughs> one you day to that, go. You're, gi you're giving these away. The stock's a buck in your face, and you did it for three cents over parity. And maybe you come upstairs for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I'm just watching. They traded like at every penny increment from 12, 13 cents to 75. <laughs> yeah, so. that does sound like an algo program the wrong way. You're right. When they're hitting uh, every bid the whole way up. Yeah, the only thing I could possibly think of it was someone who had a lot of stock to sell, you know, although I don't know why they wouldn't just go out and sell the stock as opposed to selling these calls and hoping that you get assigned on them. But, yeah, that's, it is a little odd. 
usually you got some other axe to grind somewhere that makes you want to do this. Otherwise, the parody just makes no sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, say la vie. If you don't know what we mean by parody, listeners, then just uh, just tune in some of our earlier episodes or check out the website or hit up guys like Andrew, maybe Todd and his education team and research team over there. All these people can can help you with that in-depth, elaborate concept. As we move on to our final name, get a little bit farther away from uh, from crude this time. Going to wrap things up here in China. In particular, the iShares, FTSE, Xinhua, China, 25 index ETF. So that five times fast is <laughs> the ticker symbol FXI closing today at about 39 bucks, even up about 1% or about 37 cents uh, on the day. This is the name that does about 81,000 contracts a day, doing uh, nearly 3x that, doing about nearly 240,000 contracts today, about five to one. Calls over puts, and once again, our attention drawn to the uh, the call side of the fence, in particular, SEP and October. Uh, we started kind of a little bit of a, a mixed bag here, starting off with the SEP 39's uh, paper, just lighting it up, picking up 8,000 of those for about 43 cents as the day went on, a total of nearly 30,000 uh, lighting it up on that strike for prices in that same range around 43 cents or so. Uh, we also saw 39 half sliding it up as well. It's like about nearly 20,000 of those bad boys going up. We also saw in October as well, we saw Ox lighting it up to the tune of the Ox 40s, uh, lighting it up 15, excuse me, 54,000 times. And the Ox 40 halves also about 40,000 times. Most of these were going up. Uh, looks like with some stock as well. Looks like a lot of delta neutral activity. But it seems like the lion's share of this on both SEP and OC did appear to be delta neutral buying, which in this case looks like someone's lining up apparently for the return of volatility and return of it in a very big and aggressive way uh, sometime soon here in China. Hence, uh, loving themselves some FXI. Looking here at what FXI has been up to lately. It has, uh, has it's at the upper end of its recent trough. Uh, of course, back earlier in the year, this thing was trading around 28 back in the, the frothy period of late January, early February. But before that, it got as high as about 38 back in October, November of last year. So our friends here were already back up on that level. So our friends here obviously expecting it to go somewhere but not stay here. Mr. Uh, Rock Lobster, take us home with our friends here loading up on all the vol here in FXI. Huge call buying. I, so all I FXI volatility, I think, is I'm pretty sure it's at a two-year low. Um, I was looking at buying some juice in here like two weeks ago, and we were early. So uh, actually, because of the run-up, we just started to get close to being even again on it. Um, but volatility, very cheap. Don't you, don't you remember like China was in a – recession or something and they were going to stop growing and the world was going to end and all that do you remember that it wasn't that okay. long ago that was back in that same period that jan feb period when everything was yeah. melting down and okay. we, FXI we were was moving one percent a day <laughs> it was 29 bucks and now it's 39 bucks um gosh only knows what the multiple and fxi is i have no clue um i know it's not low it's still very high so but it just looks like either – I think the SEP was closing uh, – looked like it could have been like a delta neutral close possibly, kind of just pinned to the strike, so they took it. Um, but there was tons of October, you know, October 39 call buying with some stock or just flat out buying the calls. So I don't know what got everybody so happy today in uh, China. I didn't see any new, nothing, but just enormous call buy in this thing. And I mean the – the call buy actually drove up the vol, which is weird. Um, usually, you know, you have put buying and, you know, there's there's some activity. But, you know, the stock was up at 37 cents and woohoo! hoo um, Just call buyers, vol going up and some excitement in FXI, I guess. There you go. So somebody's expecting something to happen. Someone is indeed expecting something to happen. We can probably summarize all of our odd blocks thusly. Someone is expecting something to happen. Well, it's Thursday, and it's usually do this on Monday, but we're in on today on Monday. So let's do it now. It's time for your questions. It's time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, 
Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Mail Block. Like the name implies, this is the portion of the show where you guys get to take the reins with your questions, your comments, your insights. Not just for us, but for your fellow, uh, fellow listeners, you can always hit us up via the old-fashioned way, email, website, social media, or hit us up live like a lot of you like to do as well, uh, including uh, we had some earlier. We also have, uh, what is this, J- JPM Trader hitting us up via stock twits. Wants to know, uh, particularly you for some reason, Todd, what's the call and put volume like for expiry in the 110s and 107s in Apple? Uh, well, I happen to pull this up, at least on the weeklies right now, and they seem to be fairly rich strikes, about 40,000 or so open on the 110. These, again, these are expiring tomorrow. I'm assuming it means very near term. And the 107 puts also about 12,000 open, but about 16,000 uh, going up today out there. So if all that is opening, you're going to have probably at least 20,000, if not more, uh, depending on how much of that is actually opening. Again, going back to the old saw of we don't know until tomorrow. <laughs> uh, an old complaint of our listeners why we don't have the, uh, have the OI updated uh, more frequently, but it seems like fairly heavy open interest on both of those strikes you mentioned there, Mr. Uh, or Mrs. JPM Trader. Uh, some interesting stuff there. Also, we have uh, I hate Noto <laughs> saying uh, he hates Twitter and he dumped it. So there you go. <laughs> he's not loving the uh, he's not loving feeling the Twitter. Uh, so a lot of fun comments here. This one comes in from uh, this is the old fashioned way from Zachariah hitting us up by email. He said, "What's the difference uh, between a collar and a bearish risk reversal slash?" Combo. It's an interesting question. This kind of gets into some of the uh, semantics, Todd, of uh, of options terminology. That's one of the issues with options. You know, uh, some of the terminology a little bit arcane, a little bit of minutia. Minutia, of course, the collar is you're buying to put, you're selling the call. To me, and maybe maybe you have a different connotation to this. To me, when I see because you know they're the same thing. Otherwise, bearish risk reversal uh, and uh, and a collar should be the same thing. But to me, when I see collar, that to me implies an underlying component. Uh, do you think that way as well? The collar always has to have some stocks. Otherwise, what are you really collaring? Right? Oh, no, ex- that is exactly. You hit it, the nail on the head. Is A collar is really a trade to protect a long stock position. You've, you've got the stock. You've got the underlying. Uh, you're going to um, – you're either buying a protective put and financing the, the, that put, that lower strike put – by selling a higher sp- strike call, um, or, or your, uh, but a collar is definitely an underlying component with it. Where a bearish risk reversal, which could be uh, the disparate strikes or a combo, could be the you, you can actually take a short position by buying the put and selling the call at the same strike, and it's the essential. It's essentially the same as being short the stock without having to. Uh, have someone cover your short stock position, but the bearish risk reversal or the bearish combo is you're, you're looking for the stock to go lower and you're trying to take negative Delta. Whereas a collar is a hedge really against an underlying stock position. Yeah. I see one definitely more defensive versus one being much more speculative in nature. He puts combo in here. That's, that's an old school use. That's, that's like a, that's like a rock lobster uh, usage. You call any combination of calls and puts, regardless of of different strikes, uh, a combo. Even though, to me, when I think combo, I think the way Todd does, which is you know the same strike, so a synthetic shorter along the underlying. But I know, Mr. Rock Lobster, you have a, a little bit, shall we say, older school view on uh, on this terminology. So what do you have to say here for our friend here, Mr. Uh, Zachariah? You're all just use. You're <laughs> use. Just wet behind the ears there. Use. Um, as far as combo goes. I think uh, I always think of I, it's hard to imagine. Well, first off, most people don't use a collar for just a net short anyway, right? I always see just collars. I you without using it against the stock, it is just kind of a funky short position. So, or I mean, when we when you teach skew, you you would call it a long skew position. So, you know, you know how I am with collars and combinations in general. I need I need. I need credits to do them. So, and usually it gives me one move when you own the stock. So that's, that's kind of where I am on those things. 
yeah, so in long short, uh, <laughs> pun intended, uh, you got stock, it's a collar, or you have underlying, it's a collar. If you don't, it's a bearish whisk reversal, pretty much. And it's never a combo unless you're rock lobster, <laughs> in which case, anything with calls and puts, different strikes, is a combo to him. All right, let's go. Let's see. We got time for, I think, a couple more here, maybe one, at least one more. Um, trade, Tradecraft, I like that name. Uh, he, he or she says, is there a correlation between high options open interest and high options price levels um well todd you you've been on the brokerage side for a long time as well as now you're on kind of the analytics research side uh, i think there are some people who kind of conflate those two things i think an option is an underlying stock that's very expensive is somehow going to do a, a lot of options volume can you uh why don't you, uh, why don't you maybe dissuade our listener or give them give them the truth uh, of that of that nugget otherwise we'd be seeing huge numbers for the price lines and the googles and a lot of the other names out there right Right. Now, the there, Berkshire Hathaways. Yeah, there, there is, there is. I really don't see any any correlation there at all. Um, the the price of the option is it's it's a risk transfer vehicle, right? You calls and puts, and it's a way for people to transfer risk. And when there's more buyers than there are, when there's higher demand and more buyers and sellers, the prices go up and. Uh, when it's there's more sellers than buyers, the prices go down. So the price of an option, it's a very, very fair market, and it's all contingent upon the marketplace itself, not necessarily based on any type of open interest. Open interest is just an indication that there's a lot of people who want to trade, and uh, you can see very, very large open interest in very uh, low volatility stocks, so the the, the the value or the price of the option is going to be low, even though open interest is very high. So there, there really is. They're two totally separate concepts. Have at oh, it, Mr. At, Rock Lobster. Oh, okay. It, open interest. So this is one of the things with open interest. Like, you know, people say they're, okay, there's a lot of open interest here, so this is going to mean this, or this is going to mean that. You know, all I could say is, well, not necessarily. Um, if there is open interest, it is possible a liquidity provider – to close the position might be more aggressive on um, f trying to fill an order. So you could potentially get a better fill when there's large open interest. See, see if a liquidity provider short a lot of them, they want to close them, you're trying to sell some, they might be more apt to buy them. Um, but as far as you know, it being some sort of um, – if it's if it's correlated to you know where volatility is, you know with options you know every buyer has to have a seller. What your a better indicator for a lot of that stuff is really what the implied volatility uh, has done when during that particular time of the market. Uh, the only thing open interest really can tell you is okay, somebody somewhere wants to trade calls up at that level. The problem with open interest is you never know exactly what was done, you know, against the option position. You know, so that's something when we do um, we do the odd block here and we do unusual activity, we're always trying to ferret out if we can see stock against that. If you can't see stock against that, you really don't know. You know, after a while, uh, most positions with stock and options kind of have a sort of a flavor to them. Um, so... When you see open interest and you see something that's, you know, $30 out of the money, you're like, it probably doesn't have stock against it, again, or it could be a hedge. Somebody needs it for margin against a short stock position. So what I would say is it is something that you can look at. Does it give you tons of information? Probably not. Um, so I'd be, I would just be careful just looking at open interest as sort of the end-all, be-all for um, price action and options. The endless debate. I would actually say no. Don't do that. <laughs> yes, the endless debates over open interest. How many times recently on this show, the last few months, have we gone deep into open interest and its many failings? <laughs> we probably could do a whole show on it, but instead, we've got to keep on rolling with our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. 
All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show. We tell you what we're watching for the rest of this week into the old weekend. Bit of a truncated week here, of course, coming off the heels of the big holiday here in the state. So a lot, a lot, not a lot of numbers to look at unless you're really excited about Beige Book <laughs> or some of the other jobless claims numbers out there. Not a heck of a lot, really, to watch. That said, Mr. Uh, Uncle Mike, I think we'll start with you. You've had a chance. You haven't had a chance to chime in too much lately today. It's been a quiet show for you, so we'll give you your time now. Uh, what are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend? Oil 50. Uh, do we have a shot at breaking through the 50 mark? Uh, if we do, it'll be – we've tested it a couple times, and I think the most exciting thing, which I think isn't really saying much right now, is uh, can oil break through the 50 mark? So that's one of the main things with which I'm watching. Uh, also <clears> – <throat> Uh, once we settle in a little bit after the the iPhone debate, uh, well, who's going to be right? Who's going to be wrong in terms of how Apple's going to react to that? Uh, and also, just like Andrew was talking about at the beginning of the show, bonds, uh, we actually had some downward movement in bonds recently. So uh, a lot to watch. Uh, there's a lot of pieces in place for some exciting things to happen. With all those things I mentioned, something might happen. There you go. That your 50%, your 48% guarantee that something might happen, sir? I can't go that definite. Come on now. <laughs> All right. And Mr. Rock Lobster, what's what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this uh, truncated trading week here? Well, we have a, a short week. I would like to see if this sort of post draggy sell-off bonds continues. I think it probably will stop a little bit at some point. Um, and oil rally continuing, if this is kind of real, um, I would love to see it. Um, also, uh, looking at technology stocks as they've sort of, and kind of closet wise is Tesla. Um, this is kind of a subject in our chat room because there's definitely the bloom is off Tesla. I mean, it was trading on like 245 or something when they were launching the new car, um, now it's below 200. All of a sudden, everybody's like, wait a minute. There's, you know, maybe they got some financing issues or, you know, what's really the equity going to be worth when they keep having to raise all this money to keep things going? So um, I, I think a little bit of the shell has been pierced for uh, Elon Musk, although he's, you know, obviously a hugely talented entrepreneur. I think it just might be one of these things. One of these things on um, where we just see where where it all lands. Um, so anyway, interesting. So into that's we're just taking a look. <laughs> yeah, we were so uh, we were so caught up with uh, WTI and other stuff. We didn't get a chance to really comment on Tesla. Tesla obviously uh, selling off again today, off about two and a quarter percent, or in, in a little over four handles back south of the two hundred handle again. That much watched, much ballyhooed. A uh, 200 handle out there again. It seems like you're right, Mr. Rock. Lobster. kind of a uh, a confluence of negative events out there. Of course, the heat off that Solar City deal, this cash squeeze they're coming up against, as well as I'm sure some of the reflexive heat off of SpaceX exploding. Even though it's not not the same company, the same people at the helm, so a little bit of uh, reflexive uh, hate or lack of love there, all kind of piling in on uh, Tesla. Uh, let's take it home, Mr. Todd. Uh, what are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Given that there's nothing to really watch in the markets, I'm going to go watch a one-man show, Bloodshot, at the Greenhouse Theater here in Chicago. That's what I'm going to be watching. Maybe a movie. <laughs> I'm going to go see Come Hell or High Water. And, um, the, the markets, again, it feels like it's still summer. People, even though it's after Labor Day, uh, it still has the uh, feeling that no one's quite back yet. So next week we've got some numbers, uh, CPI, PPI, I think retail sales are due again. So uh, other than that, it's, uh, it's, it's go watch something else other than the market, which, by the way, is not bad advice. I, I mean, I was looking recently, uh, when the markets get this slow and you tend to look at them really closely, looking for some action, uh, you can get yourself into trouble. Pull the trigger on some, some strange things. So, Mr. Todd, a, a fan of Chicago improv as well as movies. <laughs> yeah, <there you laughs> That's go. your plug for today. <laughs> I like it. So, yeah, just uh, if there's nothing to do, do nothing. All right, listeners, that music needs to come up against it yet again. 
Another interesting journey here on the option block today. Kicking things off, talking about all the names that are coming out today. And then, of course, getting into crude. Getting into Latin American utilities. Don't get into those very often on the show, so that was kind of fun. Uh, then, of course, getting into all of our UA names, a lot of crew related stuff. And they're getting a lot of your questions as well, collars versus risk reversals, uh, all that other fun stuff, the endless debate over OI and its utility or perhaps lack thereof. And then wrapping it up with some movies and improv here in Chicago. But before we go one last time, Mr. Todd, when you're not out there uh, watching your films and your improv shows, what is cooking in the land of all things uh, Monster? Over at Option Monster, uh, even though I... I'm always telling people be, uh, you know, be smart in, in the trades that you do. Uh, when you are looking for some trading opportunities, you want to know where the unusual activity is or what sectors are heating up, take a look at optionmonster.com. We've got some great tools and resources and market commentary to help you navigate the very challenging markets. So when you're in between your improv shows, head on over to Option Monster <laughs> and uh, check out some of their scans. Maybe you two can learn about the nuances of Latin American utilities and also joining us today on the program we had uncle mike from rcm wealth advisors uncle mike got a bit of a rest on the program today but what's uh, what's cooking in the land of all things rcm well i am all rested up and fired up as always but uh, if you are looking for a financial advisor who will work with someone who does not have billions and billions of dollars and does understand and appreciate options feel free to contact me at 312-212-3531 or send me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. All right, and last but not least, Mr. Rock Lobster, what's cooking in the land of the pit? Uh, just as I crack myself up over here, uh, we have a webinar September 24th. Um, and it will be on calendars and daily calendars. I'm glad so, no one can uh, see hopefully. our intro-show chat here because uh, <laughs> their, their, their respect level would fall off a cliff. It would fall off a cliff uh Hugely, uh, but only we're only we're only reflecting some of the uh, snarky comments that we hear every once in a while. <laughs> um, other than that, that's what we got going on. So we'll be talking about daily, uh, daily options and trying to use that in calendar trading. Mark will be doing um, more on ca calendars as well. So that will be our Saturday class, September 24th. All right, everybody, surf on over to optionpit.com to learn more. And on behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike and Todd and indeed myself, thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, and subscribing to the show. And of course, for joining us live over there in the Mixler room as well. We love you guys as well. And we'll see you next week for more of the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.